Hello, and welcome to episode 4 of All Rings Considered, a read-through of The Lord of the Rings. I am Pip, and with me is... Charlie. And today, we are talking about chapter 4, A Shortcut to Mushrooms. This is a very short chapter, and so this will be a very short episode. Um, but let's get to it. Don't sound, Charlie, don't sound too eager to get out of here, Pip. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get this done. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's wrap so it up. Charlie. Let's wrap this up. Okay. <laughs> Good hey uh, hey uh, good episode. Yeah, I think it, that was good. You know, All right, well, I'll see great. you next week. Yeah, we'll see. Oh well, okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, in this episode or in this uh, chapter, Frodo, Sam, and Pippin are walking through uh, towards Buckland, and they they wake from their experience with the elves, and they take a shortcut to stay off the road to avoid the Black Riders. And they end up at Farmer Maggot's house. And after having dinner with him, they go back out into the road at night, and they meet up with Mary on the road. So, Pip, this chapter, it's chapter actually really is short. Like, jokes aside, it actually, it's about ten pages long. There aren't too many big events in this chapter, so I actually don't really anticipate a whole lot of conversation. To start with, let's go ahead and just start. Was there any highlights in this chapter that you picked out? Anything that really stuck out to you? I only, I'll be honest, because I think I only... Uh, highlighted three things total. I think I'm looking at this. This is probably my least marked up chapter in this book. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that stands out to me is just sort of the the ominousness, the threat of the Black Riders. And I think that's kind of a, a nice little point here in this chapter. I like the way that when Frodo is going out onto this open field, he looks back up at the top of a hill and expects to see a darkened figure up at the top far away but doesn't see it. And just that sort of feeling that you can have when you're expecting something or you have that feeling of dread where you just start to see or imagine things where they're not. And was it was it in the last chapter when he when he did turn around and they did look up on the ridge and and there was one up there? I, I know last time. I think we actually it was discussed... in this chapter. Okay. Cause I just remember last episode we didn't discuss the writers very much, but that was like one image what are you? I think that was last chapter, though. I don't. Maybe. Um, I'm not really sure. If so, I totally miss highlighting it. But yeah, there is something. I do love the creepiness of these early chapters, and it's it's this interesting contrast between this sort of idyllic Shire and these creepy, terrifying things. For me, one of the something I highlighted here regarding the writers was that. We see in this chapter, again, another song that they sing, and it's about drinking. But regardless, after they sing, all of a sudden they, they stop because they hear the Black Riders like, cry. Some kind of creepy, piercing, sharp cry. And I there's been a pattern then. like At this point, I've noticed this pattern where when they sing, they often get interrupted by Black Riders. <laughs> This this seems to come up a good bit. Last chapter we saw it when they sang the 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 walking song, and that was when Frodo said like, "Oh hush, I hear hoofs. Like let's get off the road." And and then uh, they look to see, and it looks like a black rider's there, and the elves come and basically chase it off, essentially not knowingly, but yeah, that, yeah, that is there's something there, there's something going on there about like they sing, riders come, or at least riders are it, heard. It's as if the Merriment itself is something that wounds these writers, and it almost you but know, almost seems to be a, a, but it almost be more attracting them though. Yeah, or at least I, like, but I mean, sort of like in the way that it's some, an affront to them, in a way, so that it's mm. it kind of almost demands a response. Oh, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, one thing I just thought about with this question of the songs and the black writers, and what you just said about the song sort of offending them and wounding them. There is a possible parallel here to the old English epic poem Beowulf, where the monster Grendel is said to be offended by the singing that goes on in the hall of the men, and that's what drives him to attack them. Uh, oh, in that's that interesting. Poem. And I wonder if there's something going on there. Obviously, Tolkien was a professor of, of in old English literature, so he would know that. He obviously knew that poem very well. Yeah, we'll have to keep a lookout the next time that there's some singing or, or poems going on. One thing I'll say that I did like about the chapter, just a, 
a small funny thing is that it's interesting how Frodo and Sam and Pippin come up on Farmer Maggot's land and Frodo's immediately very nervous because 30 some years ago when he was a, a young hobbit he was caught several times stealing mushrooms from Farmer Maggot and he's still he's worried that he'll sick his dogs on him and the dogs will eat him and or at least they hold a grudge and it's actually it's it's funny when it happens and then but I think it actually says something interesting sort of about the theme of the transition that they're making right now where they get to Farmer Maggot's house and he you know, remembers Frodo and he kind of jabs, you know, makes fun at him for, you know, be about the mushrooms and uh, Farmer Maggot has, you know, hosts the hobbits, hobbits and gives them beer and dinner. And it's kind of a nice transition from the sort of things that used to concern the hobbits in, in the Shire to things that are more serious. Farmer Maggot doesn't really care about, you know, a, a young hobbit stealing mushrooms 30 years ago because things that used to conflicts that the hobbits used to be accustomed to are now sort of irrelevant. They're dealing with bigger things. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, um, with that, I don't really have much more to say about this. Do you want to just dive into favorite lines and then wrap it up? Sure, let's do that. So I think my favorite line is that line about that you mentioned about the cry of the Black Rider. It's, A long-drawn wail came down the wind like the cry of some evil and lonely creature. It rose and fell and ended on a high piercing note. Even as this, they sat and stood, as if suddenly frozen, it answered by another cry, fainter and further off, but no less chilling to the blood. And I think just think that's very, I don't know, very creepy. Um, yeah. It seems, I mean, it's, it's, they do a great deal about it not being, it's not a ferocious battle cry. It's some sort of unearthly, mysterious and ominous thing. And I, I quite like that about how the writer's being characterized. Yeah, thanks. And what about you, Charlie? What's your favorite line? Yeah, my favorite comes... It's actually a little paragraph that Sam says when Frodo asks him if he still feels the need to leave the Shire now that he has already seen some elves. And before it was established that his only... Or at least his... his one of his key motivations was to see elves. And now that he's done that, Okay, what next? And Sam says this. I don't know how to say it, but after last night, I feel different. I seem to see ahead in a kind of way. I know we are going to take a very long road into darkness, but I know I can't turn back. It isn't to see elves now, nor dragons, nor mountains that I want. I don't rightly know what I want, but I have something to do before the end, and it lies ahead, not in the Shire. I must see it through, sir, if you understand me. And I really like this paragraph because I think it's just something really relatable. I think it's one of those times when you can think about how, oh, like I, the reader, have also been in situations when I knew I was going to have to go through something bad, and I sort of had to find this strength inside me that there, there's something I, I need to do in doing that, right? Absolutely. And that's what's going to give me sort of comfort and motivation. So I think it's relatable. I think it's also the first sign... It's 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 the first instance of Sam not being a total like doofus uh, <laughs> in some of these chapters, right? I mean, he's he's he has those moments when he's clearly is the smarter of those hobbits that sit around and just talk nonsense about about the outside world, and he clearly is a little smarter than them. But otherwise, he's often portrayed as kind of silly and, and dopey, and so it's nice for him to get this moment when he has he he's well spoken and he has a lot of strength. And it's sort of a sign of things to come, I think, because as the book goes on, he he clearly becomes a lot less dopey uh, right. and much more admirable. And here's our first sign of it. So, All right. Well, with that being said, that does it for Shortcut to Mushrooms, Chapter 4. We'll see you next week for Chapter 5, A Conspiracy Unmasked. <laughs>